We have been in ministry with Alvin and Kristen Hall for about 25 or more years. They served originally in church planting ministry with the Arumba tribe uh, in Papua New Guinea. After working with Muslim and uh, Hindu people uh, in Asia, uh, Alvin became and is now the regional leader over there. Uh, his primary tasks are to launch new teams, to mentor, to coach uh, team leaders, to assist in whatever way possible to spread the gospel to new and unreached people uh, over there. The goal is to see God's glory established in that region. Whew. Quite a goal. Currently, they are on home assignment as uh, Alvin finishes his doctorate, but they continue to lead uh, 60 plus teams, uh, 400 ministry personnel. Now, Alvin just returned from Ethiopia, uh, so he doesn't know what time zone it is um, right now. And so be sure to respond when he preaches, encouraging smiles, little waves, laugh when he says a joke, um, try to keep him awake. All right? Yes. Very good. <laughs> Alvin, God bless you. Thanks. It is good to be back with you this morning. I, I warned Steve, I said, I'm happy to come down this morning, but I'm going to tell you right now, just getting back from Africa, I might be a little bit uh, sleepy. And um, there was actually at one time I was in a service with a guy who was preaching. Now, I want you to hear this. He was preaching, right? Now, he had a translator. But as he was preaching, he was kind of sitting on a stool. It was overseas in another part of the world. He's sitting on a stool, and as he is preaching, he falls asleep. <laughs> the preacher falls asleep. And we're all sitting there thinking, is he really awake? Is he asleep? And we all sat there quietly, <laughs> and he slowly woke back up and kept going. Well, I'm standing this morning, so hopefully I won't fall asleep. Um, but having just got back from Africa, where we have no sense of time, I said, Steve, you mean I got to finish up by a certain time this morning? That just doesn't fit my time after being in Africa. And he said, well, you can go over time if you want, but you're going to cut into the next person who is speaking during your adult uh, hour, and you're the speaker, Alvin, so if you want to cut into your own time, go ahead. I said, oh, okay, all right. But we are glad to be back with you this morning. It's been a few years. We were here for your missions conference a few years back, and a lot has been happening, and I'll give that update in the next hour. This morning, I want to turn our attention to something that I believe is extremely critical for us as a church. I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 1, and I want to look at a couple of verses and see if we can find out what this thing is pursued by God. What's it about? What's it mean to be pursued by God? I mean, that's a pretty wide open topic to talk about. What does that mean? Turn over to First, first Timothy, the first chapter, and let's read a few verses together, and then we'll jump into our focus for this morning. First Timothy, chapter 1, I'll start at verse 12. It's Paul writing to his mentoree, Timothy, I thank him who has given me strength, Jesus Christ, our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service, though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, insolent opponent. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. Verse 14, And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me, now, that word overflowed in the Greek is the word to be superabounding grace. Paul was so overwhelmed by the superabounding grace that he experienced that he would write about it in all his epistles. Matter of fact, if you take time to study out the word grace in the New Testament, used 159 times in our New Testament, the Apostle Paul would use that word 101 times in those short epistles he would write. Every epistle Paul started would start with grace to you. And every epistle would close with grace be with you. And that was not the typical greeting. This guy had experienced super abounding grace. And the grace of the Lord overflowed for me with the faith and the love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners for whom I am the foremost. Some of your translations will say, for I am the chief of sinners. What did he mean by that? Verse 16, but I received mercy for this reason, that in me, that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display 
his perfect patience. What in the world is Paul talking about? What is put on display as this superabounding grace shown in this perfect patience toward this apostle? might display his perfect patience as an example. That word example in the original language is the word draft sketch. It can be translated as a prototype. So whatever happened in the life of the Apostle Paul was a, I love the, the, the concrete picture of this word. It's, it means there is an artist drawing a draft sketch through the life of the Apostle Paul and now that draft sketch is being completed in the perfect drawing of our lives. Well, I want to know what happened in that draft sketch in the apostle's life. If that is the draft sketch of the superabounding grace in perfect patience that Paul experienced, and now that's being completed in the drawing of our lives, then what happened in the life of the apostle Paul? How was he pursued by God. As an example to those who were to believe, you and me, to believe in Him for eternal life. And I love verse 17. Paul now gets to what I call a doxology in the middle of, the, of his letter to 1 Timothy. To, to Timothy. He breaks into doxology. He's overwhelmed with such worship like we were singing this morning because of the superabounding grace that he's experienced that now is a sketch that's being completed in our lives to the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So I want to know what happened. What happened in the Apostle Paul's life that shows us he was being pursued by God? So there's something there that if it's meant to be a, a sketch that's completed in my life now, in your life now, I want to know how he experienced that superabounding grace. I want to know what happened. And to do that this morning, we're going to look back at Acts chapter 9. So I'm going to ask you to turn to Acts chapter 9. I want to know what happened. What happened on that road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9? What happened that showed us the superabounding grace of God in perfect patience as a draft sketch in the life of Paul that is now being completed in our lives? And we need the Spirit of God to guide us through this teaching this morning, so we're going to stop and pray. We're going to ask God to please speak. Because listen, folks, we're not here to waste our time. We want, we want His Spirit, by the power of His Word, to do work in each of our lives. So we need him this morning. Father, as we stop and pause now and look at the life of the Apostle Paul on that road to Damascus, help us to learn what you have for us this morning. Show us how this Apostle felt the superabounding grace of God in his life. Help us to see the sketch in this man's life that is now being completed in our lives and how we're meant to walk out this this pursuit you have of us every single day of our lives. What does it look like? The Lord, show us. Teach us. We need you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Acts chapter 9, if you're there now, when you think about the life of the Apostle Paul, i got to paint a bit of a picture here. We've got to kind of lay out this sketch for you. There are several places you can go to start where you, uh, to understand where the Apostle Paul's life started. Acts chapter 9 is the first place. Acts 22 is another story that shows us his testimony. Acts 26, before King Agrippa, he also shares his testimony. So you have to put the three passages kind of together to get the full scope of what happened on that road to Damascus. We, we see it referred to in Philippians chapter 3, Galatians chapter 1, 1 Timothy chapter 1. So Paul goes back he goes back to how it all started several times. So we're going to go back there. We're going to find out what happened in Acts chapter 9 on this road to Damascus. So let's read together, and then we'll kind of paint the sketch as we go through this chapter this morning. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, who was Saul? 
Who in the world was Saul? You know, we read this story so many times, and most of us know this, okay? We know, who put this thing in here? This is great. <laughs> you must did it for me. I was speaking at a church one time. I'll tell you a little side story here. I was speaking at a church one time, and it was like 1,000 people, right? And they had this four-foot-tall stage, <laughs> and my son was in the overflow back on the video section, and I am just into this story, and I did not see the edge of the platform. You see what's coming, right? I stepped right off. <laughs> My son was in the overflow. He's back here saying, Dad, it was so cool, man. You were there, then you were gone. <laughs> so whoever put that there, thank you. Saul, who is Saul? Who was this man, Saul? You see, we read it in our storybooks, and we see him as this guy that was kind of like, you know, over here persecuting a few believers in the, of the way. To understand the superabounding grace of God, we have to understand what it means when he calls himself the chief of sinners, when he calls himself the enemy of God. You see, Saul grew up in the city of Tarsus. Tarsus was on the level of Athens and Alexandria at that time in the world. It was one of the most distinguished cities to be from. This Saul started with a pride that he was from Tarsus. And then as he grew up as a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as a Pharisee, born as a Roman citizen in the city of Tarsus. He would sit in the synagogue under the direction of a guy called a Hazan. And the Hazan would take Saul and give him the Old Testament in Hebrew, Aramaic, whatever part you're reading, and he would have Saul repeat back to him in complete accuracy of the vowels and the accents, the Hebrew Old Testament with perfection. When we lived among a Muslim people group in Southeast Asia, I remember around the corner from our house, there was an Islamic center of a thousand students. And the Islamic leader would sit there with his stick. And as those students would read back the, or quote back the Quran in their perfection, if they messed up in one vow, the leader would take his stick and beat the, beat the child. You must get it perfect. Now, they didn't do that to Paul, but... It was the same idea. He had to get the Hebrew Old Testament down in, with perfection. That's how he grew up. That's why he knew the Old Testament so well. They actually gave him papyrus, and he would write out the Old Testament in his own script. That's how well he knew his Bible. At age 13, he was given the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament, by his father. So now he had the Hebrew Old Testament, he had the Greek Old Testament, and at age 13, they'd send him off to Jerusalem to study under Gamaliel. Gamaliel, the most respected scholar of the Sanhedrin. This is not some little teacher on the side. When it says in the, it says in the book of Acts, Gamaliel would be a, uh, on a platform. He'd actually sit on a platform higher than his students who sat on the floor below him. He was that honored. And Gamaliel would train Saul in being the best debater. He was head and shoulders above his other friends in the class. He learned to be a lawyer of the law under Gamaliel. This guy was trained. He was solid in his Old Testament theology, mostly. He'd go back to Tarsus around age 20, learn his trade, something all rabbis would do. And then later he'd come back to Jerusalem. And because of his incredible religious zeal, he said anyone claiming the way, anyone believing in Jesus must be killed. You see, when it says here, but Saul, still breathing threats, don't read over those words quickly. What this means in the passage here is that his life-sustaining, life-giving activity was to destroy the people of Jesus. Many scholars believe he was the ringleader. He was the top leader. He would go to the Sanhedrin. He would go into the synagogue, it says in Acts, from synagogue to synagogue, finding those new followers of the way, and he'd drag them, literally drag them off for persecution. It says another passage with raging fury. It's a word that talks about being out of control with incredible anger and hatred to destroy those people of the way. It says he'd go from house to house. Can you imagine this? He'd get your name. He'd find your address. He'd go from house to house. He'd drag out every single believer. Now, in that culture, to do that with men, that was understandable. 
But man, your hatred had to be really high to do it with those young brides, the women. That's how much hatred this man had. He had a zeal to destroy Jesus, to destroy those who followed Jesus. He lived and breathed with a hatred and a pride that said, I must destroy them. That's the Saul here, friends. That's why, listen, the next time you open up 1 Corinthians and you read the love chapter, penned 20 years after the road to Damascus, and you hear Saul, then the apostle, Paul, say, love is kind. Love is patient. Love bears all things. You're reading the words of an ex-murderer. And that's why when he wrote what he did in 1 Timothy, he would stop after reflecting on the superabounding grace of God and break out in doxology. Because he knew he was the enemy, the arch enemy of God. And on that road to Damascus, Paul did not move one inch to God until God moved across the universe towards Saul. Grace. Grace, all grace. That's the Saul we meet here. So that's the first part of our sketch. This chief of sinners, this enemy of God. So he goes and gets letters and he's off on his way to Damascus. It's about a five or six day walk. Now we had the honor to be in the, in the Middle East this past summer and we got to go to Jerusalem. And it was really cool to be there. It's the first time I ever got to be there. And as we were there and we're looking at the distances involved, I thought, wow, five or six days to get to Damascus. That's no little deal. He was off to get those believers. Now let's go back to our passage and see what happens next. Verse 3. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus. And suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Wow. And suddenly a light from heaven. You know what the scholars say that light from heaven was? It was brighter than the noonday sun. It was the Shekinah glory. The presence of God. Here is the enemy of God meeting the very presence of God. The Shekinah glory is in his face. He's blinded. Everyone falls to the ground. Saul's the only one who gets to hear the whole message from God. So the second part of our sketch is this. We've seen the sketch of Saul, the chief of sinners, the enemy of God. Now what's the sketch of God here? I mean, just stop for a moment and think. Logically, logically. If this is the enemy of God, and he's in the presence of God, what would be the logical response of God toward his enemy? That's it. Destroy this guy. Who is God in this passage? Full of majesty. Now, listen, here's Saul, who knows his, he knows his Old Testament. He knows what happens when Ezekiel meets the presence of God. He knows when Isaiah meets the presence of God. He knows when Moses meets the presence of God. What they all do? They fell flat down on the ground, face down, prostrate. I'm in the presence of God. Now, in that amazing majesty of God, what's God do next? Listen to this. Saul. Saul. Now listen, when Saul heard that, he knew what he knew from his Old Testament. Moses. Moses. At the burning bush in the presence of God. Abraham. Abraham. Jacob. Jacob. Samuel, Samuel. Listen, any time in the Hebrew that God would come and speak a person's name twice, it was meant to be an imperson- such a deep, personal time and extremely important. And Saul knew that. 
So here's the God of all majesty in the superabounding grace being intensely personal with his enemy. Saul. Saul. So God of majesty. A God who's so personal. A God full of compassion and empathy. He didn't have to say, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He could have said, why are you persecuting my body? Why are you persecuting friends at the church here? Why are you persecuting brothers and sisters? No, he said, why are you persecuting me? And a study of the Old Testament back in Isaiah 53 and 54, you know what it shows us? That empathy is one of the core characteristics of the very nature of God. He feels your pain. He is not a God just of the past. He's a God of the present. He is here with us, and he feels, he feels, he feels our pain. And that's why it says in the book of Psalms, he takes our tears and puts them in his bottle. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? What else is God in this passage? Remember that little phrase in 1 Timothy, perfect patience? The God of perfect patience to, toward his enemy here? If you look over, I'm not going to turn here because of time, in Acts chapter 26, when you look over there at the other part of the testimony of, the, of Saul coming to faith, it adds a little phrase right after this. It says, right after it says, why are you persecuting me? It adds this phrase, and why are you kicking against the goads? And some of you are shaking your heads. What's it mean? be kicking against the goads. It is the perfect picture of, of perfect patience. To kick against the goads, listen to this great illustration. To kick against the goads is when a farmer would be out behind his oxen in the field. And as the oxen is going through the field plowing, if that oxen did not obey the voice of the master, that farmer had a long stick that was pointy on one end. And he would take those, you know, he'd kick, he would kick that right into the, right into the backside of that ox and that ox would get that pointed thing right into his skin, into his flesh. And he'd keep, every time that ox kicked and refused to obey, ooh, another big one, until that ox decided to be obedient. Saul, why are you kicking against the goads? What kind of goads is he talking about? Well, listen to this. Listen how God was already trying to draw this man to himself. Listen. Back when Gamaliel, remember that top leader of the, or the scholar of the Sanhedrin, it was Gamaliel, the same Gamaliel that was mentoring Saul, was the same man who would go to the Sanhedrin and say to them when the apostles were out doing stuff for the gospel, he'd say to them, listen, don't persecute these, these men. We don't know. They could, this could be a movement of God. Don't persecute them. Saul had to choose to completely disregard the highest word of the Sanhedrin from Gamaliel when he decided to persecute the people of the way. Now, back in Acts chapter 6, there's another great little story. We hear about Stephen in Acts chapter 8, right? We hear about him being martyred. You know, he's mentioned back in Acts chapter 6. It says that Stephen went to the, to the synagogues in chapter 6, the Hellenistic synagogues, and would debate with the people in the synagogue. Now, the Hellenistic synagogue he went to in Acts chapter 6 was the synagogue from Cilicia. Who was from Cilicia? Saul. Scholars believe there's a very good chance Saul was not only present in that synagogue when Stephen would debate with them, he would, might even have been the very one that debated with Stephen. And what do you think Saul heard in that debate in Cilicia, for that synagogue in Jerusalem from those from Cilicia? He heard the whole gospel and rejected it. How about when Saul would go into the houses and drag off the men and women and they would refuse to recant They'd refuse to give up their faith in Jesus. He'd feel that kick of the goads. Saul, are you listening? Saul, I'm trying to get your attention. God of perfect patience. He does the same for us. You know, Steve mentioned the Arumba tribe. When we went to the Arumbas in Papua New Guinea, listen, you know, I want you to hear this story. When we went to the Arumba tribe, I didn't know the background. A guy named Tom Yalcha, an Arumba man, unbeliever, 
him and another guy started comparing notes in the late 70s and said, you know what, we've been anim, you know, they, they didn't say this, but this is what, how it worked out. They were animists all their lives. All this tribe knew was dark black magic. They were resistant to the gospel. For 40 years, missionaries would walk through the tribe and stop in and preach the gospel and keep going because this tribe was dark. They didn't want the gospel. Well, Tom Yauche and another man in the late 70s said, you know what, there's probably more to life than we realize. So they went out. Tom Yauche went to one area where he knew there was a church being planted up to the north among the Sukis. Another man went to another part of Papua New Guinea to find from another church what they were teaching. So Tom Yauch and his friend came back together after a while and they met together there at Kitty and the Arumba tribe and they started comparing notes. And because the two church groups were teaching different theology, yeah, isn't that something? Tom Yauch and his friend decided, well, it can't be true then. So they continued in their darkness a few more years. Tom Yauch finally meets a pastor from the Suki church up north and as he hears the gospel, he thinks, this is the truth. So Tom Yauch puts his faith in Christ, the first Arumba that comes to faith. We're in the 70s now. Somewhere in the, I'm not sure exactly. We don't know the exact timeline. Tom Yauche leads two other people to Christ, Medwa and Katawer. And as he leads these two other, that was Medwa and Galmange, I think, the first two. We were with six believers when I got there. These two believers are led to faith by Tom Yauche, and Tom gets deathly sick. And laying on his deathbed, he says, Medwa and Galmange, you're the only two with the gospel. You know the truth. You must, you must reach our tribe. Tom Yaha dies. We have two believers now. Late 70s. They lead four others to faith. Those six believers in 1981 started praying for a missionary. 1981. Perfect patience of God. What about this guy? You see, I was back in the States. I was already... I finished up high school and went off to Bible college. I thought I'd be a missionary. But then I went on a survey trip to Papua New Guinea. It was the hardest summer I've ever had. And I was out there with this old Aussie guy, single guy, living in a blue tent. And we, he'd feed us rotten bacon. And let me tell you, it was a terrible experience. But as I'm out there in that tent, we'd hear the stories. You know, they, they tell us about how the, <laughs> how the nationals would get in their huts at night. And they had callus on their feet about this thick because that, they went barefoot out in the, out in the mountains. And they said, oh yeah, the rats come in at night and they chew off the callus off our feet and we wouldn't feel them because it was dead skin. And I'm sitting, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm in this blue tent all summer. Rats could walk right in and start chewing away, man. I didn't want to be there. It was a terrible experience. I left Papua New Guinea and said, I am never going back and never going back single. Wrong words. A few years later, finishing up Bible college and seminary, having a, I was leading a college ministry in Northern Virginia having a blast. And I started reading the journals of Jim Elliott, missionary martyred in South America. As I read through the journals of Jim Elliott, I got into the, I was studying the word treasures in the New Testament, studying, trying to read through Jim's uh, journals. And we got, I got to the word treasures and I began to study out the word treasures. And it meant something you can invest your life in that has eternal rewards of some kind, but the only two things you can invest your life in here on this planet that will last forever is what? The word of God and the souls of people. And I said, well, I can do that in the college ministry in Northern Virginia. I don't have to go back to the jungles of Papua New Guinea. But I made a mistake. <laughs> I'd written John Fletcher, who'd been out in the jungles of Papua New Guinea. I said, John, you know, I'm wondering if maybe I should maybe come back for a short-term experience, you know, come out and build an airstrip. I'm a farm boy. I can drive a tractor. Do you want me to come out and build an airstrip or something? I was driving back from my UPS job the next morning after studying the word treasures. Christian radio station on. Talking about treasures. Wow, that's really interesting. I got home that morning and my letter came from John Fletcher that day. And I'll never forget the letter. In the third paragraph, he said, he was telling me, Alvin, don't waste your life coming out for a year or two. We want your life. And then he said this, and Alvin, I trust that you too will have a part in, and he put it in quotes, the tribal treasures. What would you do? <laughs> so, all right, that's it. I'm out of here. <laughs> Got to take a step of faith. Ten months later, I was out in the jungles of Papua New Guinea. The perfect patience of God on a whole tribe 
than a one life in Western Maryland. The perfect patience of God. Just like we see in Saul. Let's keep going. Back to verse 8. And Saul says to him, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus. Now in the Greek there, it's the actual I am. Ego a me, I am. And if you know the, a, the I am statements, it maybe is a parallel there, we're not sure. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and I will tell you everything that's going to happen to you. And then we know what happens next. Paul's led by the hand. Can you imagine? Now listen, we just saw Saul, the arrogant, proud man, Saul, who is now led by the hand into Damascus. His whole world is turned upside down. He now has no friends. None. Because those of the Jewish background will no longer believe him. Those of the way will no longer trust him because they know what kind of man he was. His world is turned upside down. Verse 10, now there was a disciple of Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, I love this part here. And he said, here I am, Lord. And he's so willing until the next verse. And the Lord said to him, rise and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a, name, a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias, that's you, come in and lay his hands on him so he might regain his sight. But listen to this. But Ananias says, now he's talking back to God here, folks. Get the, get the context. I mean, the Lord is talking to him, and he says, uh, wait a minute, God, I think you got this all wrong. <laughs> Lord, I have heard from many about this man. See, Saul was famous. He was famous. This was the persecutor of the church. How much evil he has done to your saints. God, your saints at Jerusalem. <laughs> And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. You mean the message has gotten through already to Damascus before Saul got there? Think about this, five or six day walk, and already they know, the believers know in Damascus, Saul is coming. But the Lord said to him, Go. For he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. Here's the game changer. Go, for he is my chosen instrument. And I'll give you the paraphrase. Go. This man is mine. And that changed everything for Ananias. No more questions. Okay, God, if he is yours, I will go. Now, what's it mean when he says chosen, this pursued by God? How's it, what, what's this last part of the sketch look like? We've seen the sketch of Saul, who was this incredible chief of sinners, the enemy of God. We've seen a sketch of God who comes in incredible, superabounding grace and perfect patience. But what does it result in? That being pursued by God was not just the end of the story there. Being pursued by God means you are mine. And that means every single one of you here in this room this morning, if you're a follower of Jesus, it's the same sketch, the drawing over your life. It means you belong to God. That means he is pursuing you every single morning that you wake up. What's it mean to be pursued by God when I wake up this morning? What's that mean? Now listen to these couple applications as we finish up here. It says in Galatians chapter 1, there's another story of the testimony of Saul coming to faith. He's talking about when he came to faith in the road to Damascus. And he says there, you were chosen, Paul, it's, it's Paul's writing, he says, I was chosen to be, and we have a bad translation there, it's actually, it should say, in Christ. It, many, many translations say, to Christ, but it's really in Christ. 
See, the first thing we're chosen for on the, as, a, as a sketch here is you're chosen first to be what? To be in Christ. You're chosen first to be a child of God. You're chosen first to be among those who are welcomed into the Trinity, into the very fellowship of God. You see, we hang out all the time on the doctrine of justification, and we need to. It's the legal theology that we need to stand on. But listen, theologians tell us this. The doctrine of justification opens the door for an even higher doctrine. The doctrine of adoption. The enemy of God becomes the child of God. You can't get any closer to God. You're brought right into the fold. When I was in Wittenberg last year, I got to go where they, Luther nailed the 95 Thesis on the wall of the castle church and the door of the castle church. Came home last year and I said, you know, for Halloween we're going to watch the movie Luther. If you haven't seen it yet, I'd encourage you to watch it. As I watched the movie Luther that night, there were five words that I'll never forget. When Luther's spiritual mentor was with Luther and Luther was fighting to know how to stand against the opposition, his mentor said, you need to cry out to God and here's what you pray. I am yours. Save me. Now Luther was already a believer, so what's he saying there? Well, it's a direct quote from Psalm 119.94. You can look it up later. Psalm 119.94. You know what he was really saying to Luther? You cry out, I am yours. Save me from the fear that cripples my life. Save me from myself when I get so consumed about what people think of me. Save me from a life that wants to live for my purposes and not God's. Save me from a life when I keep going back to works as if that's going to make me better before God when I must camp out on grace. I am yours. Save me. Listen, I've been in the ministry 36 years. You know what I cry out to God more than almost anything else in life now? I believe. Help my unbelief. I am yours. Save me. It's a daily battle. This God who pursues us if he ever stops, we're toast. It's all grace. But listen, it doesn't end there. The other part that he talks about in Acts chapter 26, and I love this word, and I'll finish on this. You're called first to be his child, every single one of us. That's the sketch he's completing. What's the second part of what happened in Acts chapter 9 on the road to Damascus in the life of Saul as an example, as a sketch? Here's the second thing he says. In Acts chapter 6, Acts 26, it says, I've chosen him to be my servant. Now, it's not the normal word for servant there. It's not the word for slave or deacon. It's another word. The literal translation could be, I've chosen to be my attendant, my helper. That's really what it should be translated as. So he's chosen Saul to be his helper. Well, the actual word in the Greek means an under rower. All right? And it's a picture, if you, take it, if you look at a ship, and there's a captain on the ship, and he's in charge of the ship. Under the deck, there's these rowers, right? And they're down there rowing, and they're, they're, the, they're the energy of this ship that makes it go forward. They're out there doing whatever the commander of that ship says. They are the under rowers for the ship. And the picture that we see here in Acts chapter 9 is that when Saul is called, he's called to first be a child, but also the helper of God. And as the helper of God, listen, we are not on a man-centered, guilt-driven mission. We're on a glory-driven, God-centered mission, and I got news for you, he doesn't need you this morning. He is going to finish the story. He's going to plant his church around this globe with or without you, because he's God. He invites you to have the honor to be his helper. He will complete his task. 
We left the Arumba tribe after 10 years, and we watched God do what is an incredible missionary dream. We watched God reach a tribe. Many of you prayed for the Arumbas. We took our kids back 13 years later. I thought, oh, let's take, our kids never saw it. Let's take the kids back so they can see the Arumba tribe, you know. 13 years later, we're flying in. I've got to hurry and finish. So hang in with me here. As we're going into the airstrip, the kids are all like, hey, Dad, is that the airstrip you built? I said, yeah, that's it, man. I mean, there's nothing else around. It's all jungle, one little, you know, slice of the pie for the air, little grass runway. We la- as we land and we get out of the plane, we look and the Arumbas are all dressed up. Well, no, they're not dressed up. They're dressed down. That's how it is in the Arumba tribe. When they put on their traditional dress, they're not wearing a lot. So they're wearing their traditional dress. They got their bows and arrows out. They've got their drums and they're singing these headhunting songs. And our kids look at us like, Dad, are they going to kill us and eat us? <laughs> like, no, guys, just chill, man. We didn't know what was going on. They were reenacting the coming of the gospel. And as we walked through the village with them singing their headhunting songs at the beginning of the journey, we get to the missionary house and they have up there the gospel that came with the missionaries, Alvin and Kristen. And the pastors have their hands raised to the skies singing the glory of God. God did not need us. He gave us the honor together to take the gospel to the Arumbas. At the end of that visit, they'd have a farewell feast. And they'd collect their coins and they gave them to us and said, we can't go work with the Muslims, but you can. We send you now. God does not need us. He gives us the honor. So let's complete the sketch. Every one of you sitting here are called to be a child of God. You're also called to be a helper of God. The superabounding grace is yours. I simply ask you this morning, I ask myself, are we in step with his spirit this morning? Are we living as a child and helper of God as we see here in Acts chapter 9? The superabounding grace that came to each of us, the calls to be his child and his helper to the glory of God until it covers the world. We all are part of this drawing. We all are. Father, thank you for being with us this morning. Please, please take these simple truths. Somehow take them and use them in our lives. Remind us daily of your pursuit of us to be your children and your helpers. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Amen and amen. May God continue to do a work in our hearts as he pursues um, each of us. A couple of announcements before uh, we head out of here. The Iwana ministry will start its new year tomorrow for the middle school and high school. And then on Tuesday, for kids ages three years old, up through the fifth grade. And as Steve mentioned at the opening there, if your child goes through the entire Awana program, uh, they'll have learned over 2,000 Bible verses, and they'll also learn how to apply them to their everyday life. Uh, Note that this Friday and Saturday, the men will be going uh, to Camp Calvary for the sportsman's uh, retreat. Then on September the 24th, We'll kick off the men's ministry year with a dinner. Uh, For more information on both of these events, uh, please check out the table in the foyer or email um, Pastor Kevin. Wait a minute. Wait, stop, stop. That's not this week. Pastor Steve, we just can't wait. (laughs) Very good, okay. All right, Maurice, I get that, but you better roll out of here because people are going to be trampling you if you don't want go ahead and get yeah. All right. <laughs> so what, uh, what Maurice here and Maurice II are demonstrating is a fun and worthwhile event that will happen at Wheel Skate in Odenton on Friday, September 21st from 530 to 730. Admission is free, but we're asking that everyone please bring a gently used coat or new coat uh, to be given to a child or an adult at the Baltimore Rescue Mission uh, or Caris Hospice. And then finally, uh, next Sunday is our 40th anniversary 
Uh, this hope will be leading us in worship and our founding pastor, uh, Ed Regensburg, will be bringing the message. Remember also to bring a potluck brunch for the ABF hour as we'll join together for a time of fellowship there. Please stand with me. If you would like to talk to someone about spiritual things, to continue the conversation here that Alvin began with us, there are members of the uh, prayer and care team uh, that will be down here in front. Uh, at the conclusion, they would love to talk to you for a few moments. We are pursued by an amazing and awesome and a holy, holy God. Please bow with me. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And may God continue to equip us as we live out this week as examples of being pursued by God in our neighborhoods and in our workplaces. Amen. God bless you.